Okay, hi, I'm Damon Morelli. Um, maybe you know me, maybe you don't. Hopefully you'll get to know me a bit better as you continue through this series of life and learning systems. Um, so today is the second video of the series. This one is uh, titled Autopoiesis and Molecular Vitality, uh, kind of the, the molecular foundations for life and cognition. Uh, we'll be looking uh, very quickly at um, the ideas of uh, Francisco uh, Varela and Umberto Maturana, I'm sure I butchered the uh, pronunciation of their names, uh, as well as the work of uh, Mark Kirchner, Tim Mitchison, and John Gerhardt, and particularly um, some of the research conducted by Tim Mitchison. <clears throat> uh, we'll start today uh, with Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela um, and their work on cognition. Uh, they're really instrumental in this formulation of what's known as the uh, Santiago theory of cognition. Um, they're, they're they advocate the philosophical position that life and cognition are inseparable. Um, and this really uh, eliminates the kind of dualism that has existed within the cognitive sciences or uh, in people's thinking about the mind uh, for existed for, for eons. Um, this, this kind of dualism, the, the distinction between mind and body is really a very kind of transcendental, metaphysical uh, idea. Um, they really eliminate that. They basically say, hey, there's no difference between life and cognition. Life is cognition. Cognition is life. They are connected. Um, they are inseparable. They are not distinct from each other. Uh, and this position then really facilitates a paradigmatic shift uh, within the cognitive sciences towards a more um, biological, um, chemi chemical, uh, physical framework. Uh, to summarize their position as briefly as possible, um, all living systems involve an ongoing process of growth, uh, loss, ad and adaptation while maintaining a, a distinct and discernible identity. You can really um, kind of think about this in your own life, um, is that you know, we're, we're constantly losing skin cells. I think our, uh, on, on average, uh, our, all of our skin cells are replaced roughly every 21 to 27 days. Um, our, I believe it's our spleen. All of the cells in our spleen turn over or replaced every 48 hours. And yet at the same time, though, we really are able to maintain uh, this uh, this sense of identity that you know I am Damon, you are you, um, and, and and this is really kind of integral to their idea. This is I think that uh, like, this is a kind of bound what they call bounded system or closed system, um, and and central to their idea of cognition is the uh, or their theory of cognition is the idea of autopoiesis, and autopoiesis. Uh, is that uh, all living systems are characterized by the ability to self-produce. And this is, this is a bit different from reproduce. Uh, the idea here of uh, to self-produce is, is that uh, a system uh, to self-produce, to maintain its, its self, its identity, um, it, it needs, uh, requires a constrained flexibility in, that, is, that is structured yet open and adaptive to its environment. And the example that they use in their book, uh, The Tree of Knowledge, is just the example of a cell, is that a cell has a membrane. That membrane provides a structure. That structure is essential for kind of providing an insulating environment for the process of metabolism. Uh, so that structure is integral to the process of metabolism. The, the ATP can enter into the cell then, uh, has this it's able to then be converted into energy or useful energy that then it's able to manipulate proteins that then allow for the, the construction or formation of the membrane or other cellular structures. Um, so in a way here is that the metabolism is necessary for the, for the formation of the structures of the cell, uh, and yet the structures of the cell are also necessary for the form, uh, to, to facilitate the process of metabolism. And this is kind of uh, speaking towards the idea of, of the, the, 
which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of issue, is that really neither can come first. Uh, it's not really a linear process. First you have this, then you have this. Uh, is that they really are, this is kind of this mutual affair. Um, and, and the membrane provides a structure, but that structure cannot be too strong. Um, if the structure of the membrane were too rigid, it would not allow in the external chemicals, molecules that are necessary for the metabolic process for maintaining the structure. Um, so we can. So this is kind of a characteristic of living systems. Is that they kind of maintain this this constrained flexibility, this constrained structure, and it's this kind of ongoing dynamic dance between the two. Um, <clears throat> so these, in a way, is that these these. Uh, a living system and the structure of the living system is actually integrally tied uh, to its external environment. In fact, it's so integrally tied to its external environment that we can actually not meaningfully separate a living system from its external environment. Um, so living systems are structurally coupled together to other living systems and their environments through recurrent interactions. And so in a way we're kind of looking at um, you know, as we change, as, as we grow, um, our environment changes, our environment grows. Uh, there's this ongoing process of, again, growth and loss and adaptation, and we're, we're kind of doing this together. Um, <clears throat> and especially when we, and when we get to the field of education, right, we're looking at uh, ideas of mutual bootstrapping to us, uh, the assistance of, of students learning things. And, and oftentimes in education, we take a very linear process, right? First we need this, then we need this, and then we need this, and we identify these kind of stages of development, stages of growth, um, uh, growth in knowledge, etc. Uh, and, and I think that uh, these are a little inaccurate uh, because it's more of a process of mutual bootstrapping. And here, uh, I'm, not, I'm using mutual bootstrapping perhaps a bit differently than you may, um, or that most people may normally think about uh, mutual bootstrapping. People often think, oh, bootstrapping is, is that something occurs so that then I can then pull myself up by the bootstrap. So uh, a student might, something occurs so that a student can then um, bootstrap themselves into some sort of understanding. And the point here is that, is that it's not one thing happens first and then another, another thing happens. Is that they're actually mutually occurring, um, this ongoing mutual affair. Um, so living systems mutually bootstrap each other to maintain themselves and to grow through recurrent interactions. And I think that this is very applicable to um, the growth of knowledge um, and the processes of, of education, actually, um, although they're not very well established within uh, the sy educational systems. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, given these kinds of recurrent interactions that we have and the structurally coupled, the structurally coupled nature of living systems, uh, I think that, that we can kind of um, see parallels within what are known as catalytic systems. And a catalytic system uh, is that um, the, the, the chemical process, the chemical, um, uh, or in a, in a catalytic cycle, is that the, the, the chemical uh, interactions that occur um, result, one of the elements that result from the, the, the catalytic cycle is a catalyst for perpetuating that cycle. And again, I think hopefully you can see some, some kind of how this connects with the idea of um, structural coupling and mutual bootstrapping. That the, in regard at the chemical level, a molecular level, we, we get these processes that kind of um, uh, allow for the perpetuation of themselves at the chemical at the chemical molecular level. Um, and so one great example of a catalytic cycle would be the citric acid cycle. Um, and I do not understand the, the, the chemistry of this whatsoever. And yet I'm just using this as an example that, that we have here um, a, a, a chemical process um, that through the chemical process ends up producing the element um, or the molecule or the chemical that ends up catalyzing the perpetuation of that process. Okay, so uh, examples of this, of how we kind of have these processes and the way that different living systems kind of mutually bootstrap and allow for each other's growth um, would be, for example, the South African mechanosed fly. Um, and a specific guild of uh, irises and geraniums found in South Africa. Uh, is, the, this specific guild of irises and geraniums, they have these very long stems. 
Uh, and these, uh, essentially because of the length of their stems, is that they're unable to be pollinated uh, by any other species besides this mega-nosed fly. Um, there's no way that these um, uh, geraniums or irises could have um, evolved in a way in which they had long stems and then they then wait for a, a kind of like um, uh, some kind of uh, advantageous um, uh, genetic mutation among flies that then would allow the flies to then pollinate them. Is that the fly uh, developed and evolved over the same course as the flowers, as this guild of flowers of, of, of irises and geraniums. Um, and, and the evidence actually seems to point to that, that actually these two species do seem to have kind of, um, have kind of the same, similar trajectories in regards to their evolution. And, and again, so this is you know, looking at various species, the way that they, species evolve, it's related to their environments and other species and other living systems evolving as well. Okay, so we'll get to the idea of molecular vitality um, proposed by uh, Kirchner, Mitchison, and uh, Gerhardt. And um, they do use this idea of uh, vitality in kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek way uh, because there are these kind of um, traditional associations, connotations with the word vitalism, and they're not, they're not ascribing to uh, the vitality movement of the um, late 20th century, early 21st century, or I'm sorry, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, they, they, they put forward the idea that molecular biologists are uh, engaged in the search for the, the chemical foundations of life. Um, and this search centers around genes, uh, given that genes are present in all living, in all recognized living systems or living organisms. However, given the nonlinear nature of genetic expression, they argue that... Um, that they are kind of looking towards a post-genomic view of modern biology. Uh, that, that genetics are not really this kind of straightforward um, answer, or, or genetics do not kind of follow this kind of straightforward process. And so they're really looking towards a post-genomic view. And, and I really hope that this will become um, clear in my presentations that that I'm, I am really advocating for this real post-genomic view. Is we, we really need to get past on these kind of simplistic and often um, inaccurate uh, ideas or understandings or con conceptualizations of genes and the way that they work, particularly in regards to education and learning. Um, <clears throat> so they, um, they emphasize the kind of um, the shortcomings, uh, the limitations of the common analogies used in biology uh, of equivalating living systems to machines. Uh, they, they say that these, that these common analogies are misleading and often inaccurate uh, when trying to un understand complex living systems. Uh, they give um, examples of how bio biologists will intervene in the development of a biological system, and yet that biological system is it given a kind of mechanical approach is that if we intervene within within um, within the development of a system is that then that, that you know a system develops one two three four we intervene at step two well then okay then that system then is going to take on a completely different trajectory then and of course we you know that certainly can be the case but then at the same time they also notice that often that is not the case is that we intervene at step two and yet uh, the biological system is able to recover and and ultimately arrive at stage four. Um, so, it, and then this provide this sets up a real kind of paradox uh, for, for them. Uh, they give some examples. I'm not going to go into it um, uh, just because I just don't have time. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, they, but they do they do really add. Uh, let's see. They do. They are advocating to, to move away from this kind of mechanical uh, uh, analogy metaphor towards a more statistical um, analogy or metaphor, and and I really agree with them uh, on this case. Uh, so uh, they they argue that the traditional view of self assembly, which is 
per, uh, perhaps a familiar term to those of you who are biologists, um, the self-assembly self of supramolecular structures in which genes generate highly ordered structures that functionally interact in highly ordered ways is inadequate for describing um, complex organic systems. Uh, they propose that self-organization in which rules, in which the rules tend to be general, structures vary yet converge, and relatively steady states emerge from dynamic instability. That this provides a more appropriate framework for understanding living systems. Uh, so they really advocate for a reconceptualization of what constitutes a living system, actually, uh, kind of down the molecular chain. Um, we like to think, you know, I am a living system, that fly is a living system, that bird is a living system. And, and they say, okay, yeah, absolutely, those are living systems. And yet, I think that we, and they think that we need to kind of, um, kind of go down the molecular chain uh, to where we, in the past we've said, oh, okay, well, the smallest living organism is a unicellular organism. And they're kind of saying, well, things even um, down the molecular chain uh, exhibit the characteristics of living systems. Um, and they give the examples of um, that uh, there are, um, they, use, they use the example of proteins uh, assembling into a variety of structures that function effectively as specialized organs uh, within unicellular organisms. And so this is the idea that, for example, I have a heart or I have a liver or I have lungs and I cannot live without my lungs. I, can, uh, I am uh, structurally coupled, right? Or my, or my lungs are structurally coupled to me. Uh, I cannot live without my heart. I cannot live without my liver. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my liver cannot live without me. My heart cannot live without me. These, we, is it, in a way, it's, it's kind of this system that has become structurally coupled to these other systems that result in me, and that we even find this down into, even to the protein, at the protein level, is that the proteins will actually form together in ways that fulfill kind of similar kind of functions as organs within our system. So then, at what point really can we, can we delineate, uh, this is a living system, this is not a living system? And, and they're really advocating that we kind of... Um, go down a scale. Uh, they, uh, they say that, that, for example, these protein assemblies, that they exhibit uh, size-independent patterning, uh, recovery from intervention, um, and that these are kind of characteristic of living systems. Um, they also, um, Tim Mitchison in particular, in particular, has focused a great deal of his energy on researching uh, the characteristics of microtubule assembly. And um, um, he, he proposes that microtubules, uh, that, which compose mitotic spindles, uh, that they self-organize and that they exhibit the characteristics of living systems, um, i.e. steady state assembly, dynamic instability, and the ability to adapt in size and repair damage. Um, so a mitotic spindle, what is a mitotic spindle? Um, here we've got some beautiful imagery of mitotic spindles. Um, we have a, a, a cell, and the cell has chromosomes, and these mitotic spindles form, and they kind of um, arrange the chromosome, and then they pull apart the chromosome that allows in the process of mitosis in which a cell then separates into two, two distinct cells. Um, <clears throat> okay. These mitotic spindles, uh, these kind of mitotic, these mitotic spindle structures, uh, can exist over the course of a couple of hours, and yet the microtubules that compose these spindles are basically turning over roughly every 19 seconds on average. So you have these spindles that are turning over quite rapidly, and yet the spindle is able to maintain this structure that we're able to identify as being a structure. It maintains this identity as being a structure, and it fulfills a kind of function. And yet at the same time, though, it's not fulfilling a function in a way that we would really think of it as being, traditionally speaking, a kind of cognitive function. It's much more of kind of this statistical effect. But also at the same time, though, is that this, this structure, which he argues exhibits the characteristics of a living system, is absolutely connected to uh, the environment surrounding the mitotic spindle or, or these microtubule structures. Um, in that, uh, the chromosome 
uh, which houses, which of course the, the DNA is located within the chromosome. The DNA releases uh, this chemical, GTP, and, and the GTP that's released, is, it has this kind of gradient effect, of course. It's, it's most concentrated, highly concentrated around the chromosome. So let's, let's, let's delve into this a little bit here. Is that this GDP that is released, uh, the, it's a guis, uh, guanosine triphosphate, uh, ends up connecting and bonding together with uh, the guanine nucleotide exchange factors, uh, these GEF, and this, when they bond together, they're reasonably strong in their bonding, and they bond together in certain self-organizing ways. Um, and yet, at the same time, though, is that there's also water within this environment as well, and that facilitates the process of hydrolysis, which then you will then lose a phosphate, which then uh, returns, uh, the, um, provides again a, the, the catalyst uh, by that, that, that breaking apart then provides a catalyst for the disassembly, but then at the same time now these proteins are again available uh, for being reassembled again uh, within the region, within the space. Um, and so they, they put this, they, they characterize as basically being an autocatalytic system in which you have the, the, the GTP pays, um, or GDPAs, uh, that, that the this, this cycle is providing catalyst for perpetuating the cycle. And the cycle is going through a process of assembly and disassembly uh, that is, is being uh, facilitated by the release of the GTP uh, by the genes and by the hydrolysis, the, the water within the environment. So again, here we can see an example of the, the assembly and catastrophe and disassembly. And these, these microtubules kind of go through the process of assembly and disassembly, assembly and disassembly. And some of these microtubules last comparatively much longer than other microtubules. Now let's think about this, is that if the, the chromosome is releasing uh, the GTP, and again there's this gradient effect in which it's higher concentration, and that this GDP then um, allows for kind of these strong molecular connections, is that any microtubule that happens to be moving towards the direction of the concentration of the GTP will be more likely to um, maintain its stability, whereas any microtubule that is assembling in, uh, in a direction or a path or a trajectory away from the GTP concentrations will be less likely to maintain its assembly. And so this process of which these um, uh, microtubule assemblies uh, grow is not really a functional planned kind of event or, um, or occurrence or phenomenon. It's much more of a statistical phenomenon, is that they're constantly forming and reforming and disassembling and disassembling, and yet certain ones are, will maintain themselves longer, just dependent upon uh, chance, um, the, the frequency of the occurrences, and that some of them end up going the, in an appropriate trajectory to then fulfill their function. And so I hope that this, um, and, and what's interesting, what's really interesting is that uh, when they then um, measure out uh, how long some of the, the, the frequency of these microtubule assemblies that last a relatively long time uh, and the, the, the lifetime of most of the assemblies ends up falling actually onto this um, uh, log scale, um, which is, again, think back to the previous presentation. Um, so I, I hope that we can kind of um, take this uh, idea in which they're saying that, that, that uh, these uh, mitotic spindles, these microtubule assemblies, are representative of a living system, and a very simple living system, uh, and that uh, the way that we can kind of see the statistical regularities as to how the kind of, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the quantity of occurrences or of of uh, formulations or the, 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 uh, of the chemical molecular interactions and bondings actually result in uh, this kind of what we would often term as being a kind of functional outcome. And be begin to kind of think about this a little bit in regards to cognition, in regards to learning, is that perhaps cognition and learning is not so much of this kind of um, uh, very mechanistic um, prog progression 
uh, is that it's much more of a kind of statistical progression is that you know we're, we're likely to uh, ultimately uh, you know you know call this a, a cell phone or a hand phone um, just through the quantity of our interactions uh, within you know a variety of contexts uh, you know th that we will actually arrive towards kind of these common understandings and I'll try to work towards in the future as to how these um, how knowledge is kind of socially coordinated um, in a biological, social, sociobiological sense uh, in the future. Um, so uh, hopefully you can kind of see the relevance of this, of this analogy, of this metaphor, and how it potentially might apply to education. And I look forward to speaking to you next time. All right, take care, bye.